One night Farmer Brown was taking the air, locked up the barnyard with the greatest of care. Down in the hen house, something stirred when he shouted, Who's there? This is what he heard. There ain't nobody here but us chickens. There ain't nobody here at all. So calm yourself and stop that fuss. There ain't nobody here but us. We chickens trying to sleep and you butt in and hobble, 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 hobble with your chin. So, straight away, one chap says, man, <laughs> he's Jordan. I said, no, man. I said, Jordan is a maestro. He's the man that make the music, man. I said, I only do the move. He says, man, he's only Jordan that make the music. <laughs> Could work that move out. Yeah, I remember it all started um, one Christmas time some years ago when me and my dad were sat in the front room alone, surprisingly, because mum's in the kitchen cooking and the kids were upstairs. And he was playing an old Louis Jordan record, I forgot which one it was, and started telling me about the first time he'd heard it. And I think it was one of those stories that was about, I snuck out of the house and I went to the dance and I was dancing with this woman, as they always do. And um, we started talking about parenting, I suppose. His dad, him, me, and, and music. Hey, boss man, what do you say? It's easy pickings, there ain't nobody here but us chickens. My daddy is a funny man, you know. Mm -hmm. A funny man. He's not saying go to church once a week. The man lives near the church. Me can do no right. Him can do no wrong. <laughs> no. All I want to do is have a bit of fun every now and again, you know. But not him. No, sir. Him just expect me to work, work, work. And go to church. I tell you. Even when I was a tiny little dad, me sneak out the church, you know. Mm -hmm. Me sneak out when you preach at him. Him go on and on and on about the hotness of the sin and the devil and everything. And everybody around me just sat down, nodding and agreeing, you know. Hallelujah! Praise God! So me, you know, round the back with a few friends, and we start to sing and dance. Now you say, I was pretending to be pastor at home, so I said, Come on to me, little children, roll it up here. And we start singing and dance real hot, you know. Next thing I know, my daddy is outside looking at me. Man, <laughs> I feel so shame, you know. I don't feel you say, the man tear my behind as I was running over the afternoon, you know. And with every crack, him give me the whole of Pastor Jones' sermon, word for word. <laughs> you know, I have to leave him. I have to leave him. I'm 17. A man. I mean, they want to beat me if I dance. No, sir. Ever since my mother died, there ain't nothing around here for me. I was away from the nearest town, just grubbing round in the earth for a few shillings. This is no place for a man to go. No place at all. Well, with this pressure of growing up, with parents, it was so severe for you to do certain things and not to do certain things that you have to watch yourself knowing that you're not to do that, that certain things in harder not to get the pressure from them because with them it's not just only a matter of say talking to you or say giving you a smack we call it beaten where you get that beaten <laughs> It's either a strap that is tear for the occasion, or the cut, what we call whip, or switch you want to call it, you know. Anything that is sleazy, it'll bend but it don't break. It's tear, 
if it's dirt cut waiting on you, the trees them, well, the trees them is in the yard, and you do anything wrong, and they call up. So, well, who does such a thing? I say, well, it's me, sir. Why do you do it? You can't give a good reason. They think you shouldn't do it because you should know better. And you can't give them a good reason. And they grab all of you. And they will lead you right to that place there and cut a switch. And man, and they give it to you. <laughs> Sometime when that one smash up, they cut another one. <laughs> well, if you're lucky, you're able to break away, you, you take running for it. And, and sometimes it don't pay you to run. Because they stone you. <laughs> because it doesn't matter how far you run go. Oh. You have to come back to sleep in the house that night. <laughs> and if they're not satisfied, that you get away and they're not satisfied. You know it's there. Yes, and it's worse. <laughs> Anytime you come in to come to bed, you get it right in the bed. I just managed to make enough money to put food and drink into my belly. And go dance most nights, but I can't complain. A lot of people, but no jobs in Jamaica, so me. <laughs> I just keep out of trouble and I stay free. <laughs> I tell you though, when my cousin Vincent came over a few years ago, he thought I was mad. No proper job, no money. But then he realized that I am a free agent, yes, sir. I do as I please. <laughs> now, Vincent, he's a few years older than me. An educated man with schooling, qualification, everything. Now, you see, he has been in England since 1940, in the Air Force. So he was wearing this big uniform, medal, everything. So when he came over, I was so proud of him. I want to show him off to all my friends then. <laughs> now the thing is, Vincent is only a flight mechanic, but with all the drink I had, <laughs> I started to tell people that he fought in the Battle of Britain, <laughs> that he was an officer, and even that he used to have dinner with the King of England. <laughs> He's working on a building site now, you know. 12 pound a week, and here am I. Three pound, if I lucky. Enough for one, but two? I don't know, you know. I must be mad. Perhaps it's for the best that she said no. But what you talking about, Jordan? Eh? What's all this maybe business? You can work hard, can't you? Yes. You could work hard, pull yourself up, make something out of this flower business for true. A stall on the market. Mm -hmm. A small shop selling all sorts of things, then you could buy a little house for Pearl and I. But first, you must buy a barrow. Buy a barrow, sell more flowers, save up some money, and that way this star will be mine for sure. So I went down to this place and chopping the wood, but I noticed while chopping the wood, every time I lift the, mas lift the machete, the force of the wind blowing like, you know. So I said, well, this thing's serious. Jamaica, that sunny West Indian playground, has been struck by a devastating hurricane. These amazing pictures bring concrete evidence of the extent of the disaster, as winds reaching nearly It reaches to the stage where the house yes, feels, <laughs> and see if you could feel it trembling, and the wind rushing through the place like until when we out on the veranda, we hear a big crash and one at the back room. So we went into the um, dining hall and opened the room door. We saw one of the coconut tree. Inside. It fell right down, you know, with the, the head part with the limb and with the coconut bunches and everything. Them just hung down in the room. <laughs> so we see now that that thing is bad, man. Very bad. So when we have a, a look out along the seaside, the big trees them and called guango tree along the big trees them and a, a lot of them was getting real strip. The big branches they break off and scatter all about the place. In all, over 150 people lost their lives and damage to property amounted to 16 million pounds. But we in Britain, through the Relief Fund, can follow the example of the royal family in helping these loyal and hard-working members of our Commonwealth. Nobody have any money no more. Nobody want to buy flowers no more. 
I work hard for seven years now, and look where it get me. And I think to myself, ever since I born, time's been hard here in Jamaica. My daddy, my granddaddy, his daddy before him all just grubbing round in the earth for a few shillings. They frighten me, you know. They frighten me when I look into my future. And I see myself at 40 or so just doing the same thing like I'm doing now. I mean, one, no pearl, no family. What's a man supposed to do in Jamaica, eh? You can't build a decent life and fresh here. The general thing even from school days, you learn that um, England is the mother country, half the, the West Indies. The West Indies, them are his the are children. children. <laughs> you understand me? So everybody so far is subject to, your mother. to the queen and the mm -hmm. king. Mm -hmm. You understand me? And because when it comes to the Union Jack, it stands predominant in the, in the island. And on certain key gentlemen of certain holidays and all them and things. You see a lot of the family with, 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 um, like with the um, school children, them, them have the flag and they march and all mm -hmm. them things. And you hear a lot about England. Auspiciously had begun the Queen's three-day visit to the island of Jamaica, which has been under the British flag only two years short of three centuries. Pearl. Pearl, she took it real bad at first, you know. Well, she wanted to come too, but I said, no. Mm -mm. Not until I get a steady job, a house, those kind of things. Then we get married. We stay for maybe five years, earn lots of money, and then come right back here to Jamaica and set up our own little flower shop. <laughs> Aye. And then we sit down and we remember all the things we were taught in school about England. The War of the Roses, Waterloo, Buckingham Palace, <laughs> and our little songs then they try to teach us to sing in school, you know. Rule Britannia, and there'll always be an England. And yes, red, white, and blue, what does it mean to you? Shout it aloud, Britain is awake. These are the chains that nothing can break. <laughs> The sky was grey, the sea was grey, all the streets were grey, and there was grey smoke everywhere. Man, no one knew where them hurricane must come from. And boy, <laughs> it was so cool. Bits of snow and thing in the air, just like I see back home in the pictures. Man, 
When I see all that red brick and dark alleyway, I feel like a shadow in a grave. I said to myself, is this England? <laughs> yes. Coming to Nottingham, we mm, catch a train in London, St. Pancras Station. Uh, yes, I can remember. It was a dark night. Damp. And, and the train, well, you couldn't see how it for a much being it's dark. But it feel like a long, <laughs> lonely ride. Well, <clears throat> reaching Nottingham, the, the morning, when I wake, come outside and having a look around. The sun was shining. Well, it wasn't very warm for summer. <laughs> well, for scenery, the sight wasn't very inviting to me. <laughs> it didn't look glamorous, as I was thinking more or less. You know, England would be a pretty place. We're very nice. Well, coming back from the West Indies, we have the sunshine all the time green trees and all the movement is gaiety and bright. England seems to me very dull, disappointing. The buildings and they did look dreadful. Everything brick, red brick, grey brick. <laughs> Looking to see some smashing looking house. Look brilliant on the outside. Well, that was all in my mind. Good evening. Hey, my name is Dad, you know. Listen, I came over from Jamaica this very afternoon, come by ship, you know. <laughs> and I noticed uh, everybody is looking at me like me mad. So I stretch out my hand now to shake this young lady hand who was sat just opposite to me. And she just <laughs> in her seat. And the young man she was with, he leaned forward and gave me a real dirty look like it was going to hit me. So I just sit back now. <laughs> and I notice, sir, uh, the man beside me is just pulling up on him seat. Then he get up and he gone out. And the woman and the man too, they get up. And this time she gave me a real dirty look and out the gun and slammed the door behind them. Chew. What me do? Hmm? I was just trying to be friendly and everybody get up and walk out and leave me. So then, I remember the little book that they gave me on the boat. Hmm. If you have just arrived in this country, it may seem to you that the British people are unfriendly because they do not speak to you in the streets or in buses and train. <laughs> I had to laugh to myself, you know, because I knew that was true already. You discover that it, plenty of it will have to depend on you. It depends on what you can endure, what you can't endure. You understand? Because even with me, Several times, things does happen that I could more or less go mad when I don't. <laughs> because you, you half prepare that when things happen, you try to weigh the situation and then when you look through it, you say, well, I can survive. And you don't worry. You know, you, you try to keep the feelings down. You know, just to get along. It isn't that you really hide yourself or tuck yourself in that you won't be seen. Because you know you have to be seen. You made me cry when you said goodbye. So after the first week now, I get my pay packet. Eight pounds, you know. 
Eight pounds for one week work, Lord, I was so happy. I run home, put on my best shirt, best tie, and my brand new braces. And I was going into town to find me a place to dance. My heart, when you sing, we're apart. Now the place was full of people dancing. And I pick out this girl from my partner. I went over and I asked her for a dance. Now, you know, at first, the girl, she was a little bit unsure. But after a few, <laughs> with our friend then, she said yes. So John began to dance just like in the old days. <laughs> I bought a blazer with the rock and roll sign, musical note sign, rock and roll. And I bought a shoe. That shoes more or less they have the musical sign with a fancy lace tie on to it like and thing. So that of itself more or less presents you as a rock and roll dancer. So people choose to call me rock and roll. And the girl, she looked pretty happy to you know, because she probably thought I couldn't dance too well to begin with. Bit by bit start to be real good and people start to look at me and right there and then I begin to feel at home you made me cry and all of a sudden this big fella with sideburns came up to me and he said you blacks you niggas why don't you go back to the jungle know what to say you know because everybody was still looking at me so I put myself up I look him straight in the face and I say I just want to dance and him say well nothing near you ain't and especially not with any white woman I look around me and I couldn't see a friendly face in the place it didn't hurt me you know it did hurt me because I just didn't know how I could fit in. I just did not know how I could fit in. While the reception was going on, there was a few people that come to the reception and they said, riot down St. Answell Road, because them, them stoning blocks and them, them have motorbikes after the blocks and everybody running and hiding. But you couldn't really get the full of what goes on. And you couldn't really say, well, oh, it will be in the paper and you'll buy a paper and read about because. You know for sure that what is in the paper, they are going to paint the black, that is the black them was at fault. When we know that the black them was so scared of what, because these bloody skinheads, them was really, really terrible. They used to really just ride around and look where the blacks them is, you know, and them really go and torment, fling milk, buckle and all them things at your door and all like that, you know. They was really tormenting. So let's roll along. The future is in ID. In many ways, they make attempts to provoke you to see if you retaliate, that they more or less can, them can satisfy the hand by doing what they want to do. Well, is you just... More or less, you just sight them and go about the bases and just ignore them as if, like, nothing happened. Like, you know, and, well, it's cool, nothing happened there. But it, it was something like this. What they're doing, because they're doing it to, to provoke you, and what they're doing, it, if it reaches you that much, and if, like, in a word, I wouldn't say brave, I would say, if you were silly enough to react at that time, then you come to the worst end, because there wouldn't be nobody there to defend you. And, uh, and the system of how the police really happened operate in them time you more or less would have a feelings of relief to see the law about and all of them and say these things wouldn't happen but they're there and it happened 
And say more, if you're depending on them to say, well, get them off your back, you know, you had it because it's like, it's like them seeing the don't see they turn the back. <laughs> you understand? Because, say for instance, if it was you, the colored you, going about and portraying yourself like that, they would come down on you heavy and stop you. You understand me? But these blokes, they do it, and they know, and they do nothing about it. And uh, it's a something like this that if you complain, say you have been attacked out there by three or four persons that ask you if you know who did it. Well, the streets, you don't know them. And if you see them again, would you know them? You won't know them because to you, white boys are just white boys. <laughs> So if you see them again, you wouldn't know them. But, like but that was the kind of a system that you, you, you would have to go through to get anything done. I saw PMP, JLP, members of the clergy, the judiciary, and people from all walks of society. I do believe that us immigrants that was in the country here did believe that he coming to the country it was something to us that somebody is there to speak for you in some respect, to represent you. Whether if it would work in your behalf, yes or no, but the feeling was there among immigrants that somebody, you know. But generally, Naaman Manley, eh, the political party that he really resents, which is the PMP, People's National Party, to us is equivalent to overhear the, um, the conservative party, conservative yeah. party. If he was a good government in Jamaica, plenty of us wouldn't come to England. You know, because in Jamaica at the time, um, he was just really more for the rich, but not for the poor. It's only when election really, then you see them creeping up and want people to vote for them. You know what I mean? And saying, oh, good days and so on. Keep, but keep you forward. living in Jamaica, dear, they have nothing at all to do with you as the poor people. Because for the rich, the more prosperous they are, they more or less spend the money, provide job, make it possible that work is there and such like. So they imply the poor people, which is a system like this. You'll, you're poor and you'll work for a living and remain poor till the day you die. The only thing you could look forward to is to get out of Jamaica and try to have a better life. What sticks in my mind that England that did own Jamaica, it was a number of years. And as far as what I know in growing up, the thing about Jamaica and England is what? England can use Jamaica to get out of Jamaica for England. While England wasn't doing nothing to say, Bill Jamaica or for the Jamaicans. Mm -hmm. so, and uh, with them getting the independent, I, I start thinking now, wonder if England try to leave them in a position that they can get strength to build themselves mm -hmm. up from there, which I doubt it. Because um, the Americans more or less was getting this backside material to make aluminum mm -hmm. and they use the big machine and bulldozer and bulldozer down certain places keep shifting the hurt get out the stuff what they want and dump the hurt but 
is the English government more or less was getting the benefit of what the Americans was yeah. doing there, mm -hmm. not the Jamaicans. Well, yes, they get job while they have this big machine and doing this and all, and people locally around, they get employment there. But that was just that. There was no future in that. Now independence is good for the young and the old, also for me and you. Yes, independence is good for me. The boy, they make more noise than do Creed sound system. All right, I'm coming. <laughs> uh, not the way life can change so quickly. One day you're out there, you're dancing and you're drinking. And then before you know what's happening, it's all doo-doo, nappy and gripe water. <laughs> you see Tony, though? Boy. You see the boy go? <laughs> He's a real little mover, you know. Mm. Just give him a few more years, and there'll be nothing to stop him. On Saturday night, on Sunday, oh my God, we all all... <laughs> We used to have our record out and we was dancing and things like that around the front room. So everybody just know that Saturday and Sunday it's dancing time. And we used to have some friends that they used to come down sometimes Saturday night and sometimes Sunday. And sometimes they used to bring record as well. And oh my God, you wouldn't believe it. <laughs> everybody gets together. And everybody, I think, if, an, if they miss anything most, it got to be that front room around here on Saturday night and Sunday. Because, and we never say, oh well, you, you, you're too small, say, oh, you know, we always get everybody together, let it's everybody, everybody, everybody do it, everybody you know, everybody dance <clears throat> and... I'm glad it was like that because even now, they keep talking about it mm -hmm. and say what they remember mm -hmm. and thing and... They appreciate it now. <laughs> Memories. The smell of pork, steam, and peas. The telly and Batman. Batman! I was really into Batman. <laughs> Dad, working in the bakery. Me, bawling my eyes out infant school then came junior school and then we moved And on the telly, send them back home. Too many blacks. They'll put excreta through your letterbox. I ran to the kitchen to ask mum what excreta meant. When she told me, I was shocked. Repatriation and resettlement. We well, we've got to go back to mum. And mum just looked at me, then gave me a great big hug. Then, when the Nazir family across the road had excreta put through their letterbox, I thought perhaps people would think it was us, my friends, me. I think the activity that happens in Britain is a combination of the confusion that people feel about not knowing exactly where they should say they are from. And what we have to deal with is where we are. People like us haven't been here before because we are a new generation of people of our own aspirations and our own dreams based on the fact that we were born and brought up here and we haven't got an easy escape route. Um, I, I love it when people come up to me and say, do you want to go back and then leave a pause because they're not quite sure where I'm supposed to go back to, but they've got this idea, even if it's a positive one of the fact that as a black person, I recognize that you've all been trying to get away from Britain. Where do you want to go back to? There's an automatic assumption that I want to go back to somewhere, there's always a pause. It's like, are you Jamaican? Well, my parents are from Jamaica. All right, so have you been back to Jamaica? Well, no, I've never been to Jamaica. All right, why not? Why not? 
I'm supposed to want to go back, and I think ultimately there's still a feeling of like, we want you people to move out of here. 1978, and I couldn't get a job nowhere. I tried, but who were going to give me a job with so many white people on the dole, huh? And then Maggie gave a swamping speech, and the newspaper men and the beasts were just stopping the youth on the streets. Me? I just carried on with my dancing. Funk and soul at the old days. Me and Errol together. Blues and sound system. England is a bitch, 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 England is a bitch, 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 When me just come to London town, we used to work on the underground. But working on the underground, you don't get to know your way around. England is a bitch. There's no escape in it. England is a bitch. There's no running away from it. Me get a little job in a big hotel. And after a while, he was doing quite well. Them start me off. As a dishwasher, but when me take a stock, me not turn clock watcher. England is a bitch. There's no escape in it. England is a bitch. September 1980. I went to dance college in London. Me, Tony Blake, all day and every day just dancing. I'm with some money in my pockets. I remember when I left on the train, Mum was in tears. Dad and Errol just looked real proud of me. I was thinking, why, man, am I going places? I was going to be the best dance that school had ever produced. And people respected the best in this world, didn't they? And then came 1981, the Deptford fire. 13 black youth burnt to death. No racial motive, said the police. And so did the newspapers of Swamp 81 at Brixton. 1,000 people stopped and searched in only six days. The youth thought the police in the streets, in the newspapers, and on the telly. In Tuxted. Must side and Hansworth. Black and white. It leads. Nottingham. Bolton. Rebellion. It Luton and Leicester. Birkenhead. Police oppression. Hackney. Woodgreen. Walthamstow. Rebellion. In Hull. And Wickham. Southampton. State oppression. Halifax. Bedford and Gloucester. Rebellion. Sheffield. Coventry. Portsmouth. Fascist attack. Bristol. Edinburgh. Reading. Rebellion. Huddersfield. Blackburn. Preston. Unemployment. Chester. Stoke, Rebellion, Shrewsbury, Wolverhampton, Newcastle, Poverty, Knaresborough, Derby, Stockport, Rebellion, Rebellion, Aldershot, and dozens of other towns and cities across the country. Rebellion. Rebellion. Cause an explosion between man and man. Oppression is worse than the grave. Better to die for noble cause than to live and die to save. Blessed are those who Oppression is worse than the grave. Better to die for noble cause than to live and die. Better live and die to save. 
The audience clapped politely. I could just about see Mum and Dad back there in the fourth row. They'll understand, I thought. They'll understand. Extremely bad taste, someone said from backstage. Me. I couldn't understand it. You see, Simon had just done this piece about South Africa and apartheid. Everyone said it was wonderful. Yet we were both talking about the same things. Couldn't they see that? Couldn't they see? I suppose it's just hip to care about blacks on the other side of the world, but not when they live right next door to you, huh? And it was Rosalind's turn. An extract from Swan Lake. She got a standing ovation. Now, Rosalind, she's a brilliant dancer. Top of the class. But Swan Lake. Tony, what do you think you're doing, boy? Hmm? I feel so ashamed to be a father here. Have you forgotten all the burning and the looting and the thieving? Hmm? How do you think your mother and I feel when you're bringing bad name and their family? Like I couldn't that? believe I was hearing this. Dad, have you forgotten that Errol's in prison? Your son was arrested and put in prison for doing absolutely nothing. Well, let's get into a taxi cab is a crime these days. How dare you talk to me like that, eh? You think I'm stupid? Of course, I know what happened to Errol. It was wrong. But that's no excuse for you to get on stage and make a fool out of us all. What happened? You want to make it worse? Just because a few greedy people were on television set? And Mum was just sat there looking real worried. But I couldn't hold myself back, you know? Why stop at the greed, eh, Dad? What about all the violence then, huh? All those innocent police officers having their shit kicked out of them by a 15-year-old kid in the back of a black Mariah, huh? Well, what more can you expect from a people who are constitutionally disorderly, eh? In the Jamaicans, you have a people who are constitutionally For 30 years, I've been working in this country. In and I work damn hard to bring my family up, right? Authority. And look how you repeat. Good old hmm? Kenneth Newman. By fighting <laughs> with the police and doing bricks and things. On our multi society, don't we, Dad? I'm sorry, no but there's nothing you can do about it. You see, you have been labelled along with every other black person in this country. Right you and we back in Jamaica just grubbing round for a few shillings. My God, Tony, you don't know the half of it. And I don't want to talk to you, Here, yeah? I do not want to talk to you until you get your senses back. I think we're fighting them to get what they were trying to get for themselves. Um, and I think they're fighting for us, of course, because they know that the world is hard and cruel and they want to protect us from it, but they know something they, they can't do it. Um, and I think that is one of the horrible dilemmas of being a parent. I say, remember who, who used to wash your clothes for you? They had a hard time. They had a really, really, really seriously hard time. And that's why they are who they are now. That's why they've been battered down to positions where they don't feel as strong or as confident as they did, because um, 30, 40 years ago, they were on the streets of St. Anne's with bricks and bottles in their hands, fighting people because they had to do it. And they might not do it so keenly now, but they've done their bit already. And what's happened is uh, we're now the younger people and we're doing what they did in a slightly different fashion because we still have to do it. Um, if we didn't do it, they'd be ashamed. If we do it, they're still ashamed because they don't want us to have to do it. But there is no way around it, really. He was in prison in a prison, in the situation that they keep him in, and, and all them thing, him, don't get people to talk to an alien, don't get them to read an alien, anything, as if they put him in prison wasn't enough punishment that degraded for a free man. So, finding out that he, he was free from that, it means a lot to me, and I was glad that he, he alive to live, to be free that much, but I know free in the right word of his um, freedom for his people. He is not free yet, but he is more privileged yeah. to be heard and to be seen and to express himself. Oppression <coughs> and the privilege, deprivation, poverty. You tend to expect a better behavior, better response for agony and pain and whatever it is. It's like, say, well, you expect black people to be able to face up to it 
fight it without retaliating. When you think of how they tell you how they've had life, you've got it easy. What they had to go through, school and everything, is we just don't know how lucky we are. But I always tell them, try them best. Don't make them be the cause of what happened. Don't look for trouble. But if trouble comes your way, don't back down. Take up yourself. Eventually you calmed down because you realised that hitting them, obviously, wasn't the solution. It just made things worse, if anything. They'll be always prejudiced. They'll be always racist. And the only way we can conquer it is as a force or breaking down the system or both together. But we have to get in the system before we can do anything about it. You can't expect people just to understand you because you think this way as well. They have to be portrayed. You have to um, educate people before they can understand. Anything that happens to a person, they will defend his own or her own. So whatever happens to me or my family, we will defend each other. Yeah. Yeah. I think every, every person that fights for one position, every black person that fights for it, breaks down a part of the barrier. So one day, one black person is going to get it. I think I would like to, my, children, my grandchildren them should grow up into a world that everybody really gets sensible and get with it and say, well, we are here and we are all here to stay. So they give you a choice now, so well, take one, I'm here. But things must change. Change, 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 change. Yo, what's up? Take a look at us now. We're on a stage was once in the crowd. Britain of the 90s for young black people that live here, particularly those that, that will be living here forever as far as they see it, is a very different world to the world of the 70s and the 80s. But I think that the fact that 70 and the 80s of course existed has allowed them to say, we're not doing that. We saw what happened, we're not doing that. I think what's happened is that Black Britain is getting stronger and beginning to recognise that it is actually quite powerful, not, not politically, not necessarily like we're strong because we know that if we must around our MPs, they will do things, but they know that they can control their own environment in the way that they can do and they are doing. There is a, a feeling of confidence around that I, I want to be young again. I want to grow up with it because I never I never had the same one. We had sort of like we had the, the Hansworth seventy nine image of black man which was like you're strong and you're radical, but it, you know, you're on your own really. What people now have is um, a sense of uni unity with a lot of people across the nation that look like them, sound like them and know what they're talking about. And I, I envy younger people that, but I hope they use it wisely. <laughs> I ring a taxi from the house about quarter past ten, which usually gets uh, between half past and quarter to eleven, which is nice and late. Um, Fred records and sometimes the turntables and mixer into the back of a taxi, drive off to the heart of good fellow, get there usually at eleven o'clock. And hobble, 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 it's a sin. Tomorrow is a busy day. We got things to do, we got eggs to lay, we got ground to dig and worms to scratch. It takes a lot of setting, getting chicks to hatch. Oh, they ain't nobody. I'm ready to leave all the house. Quarter past five, my twenty past five, well, half past five, the latest. But I'm, I'm running late. <laughs> and then I ride to work. We'll reach there, says quarter to six, twenty to six.
is a busy day. We got things to do. We got eggs to lay. We got ground to dig and worms to scratch. It takes a lot of sitting, getting chicks to hatch. There ain't nobody here but us chickens. There ain't nobody here at all. So quiet yourself and stop that fuss. There ain't nobody here but us. And kindly point that gun the other way And hobble, hobble, hobble off and get to the hay Hey, hey, boss man, what do you say? It's easy pickings, ain't nobody here but us chickens 